What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, August 12th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, biomass power station produced four times emissions of a UK coal plant, according to a new report. We can't make this up, folks. Next up, politicians backing net zero, working harder to make gas prices much Higher next up, U.S. oil industry pumps record volumes of, of oil with fewer workers. Talk about synergies there. Finally, in the new segment, second LNG tanker seen docking at sanctioned Russian facility. Stool then tossed over to me. I will quickly cover what happened with the oil and gas markets on Friday and talk to you about what we saw with the rig counts. And then we'll finish up by uh, making a few predictions about what we think this week will bring. As always, I'm Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Let's start with our buddies in the UK. Hey, a biomass power station produced four times the emissions of the UK coal plant, says the report. Drax received 22 billion pounds in subsidies, being the UK's largest emitter in 2023 through the company Rejects Flawed Research. Let me go through some of the flawed research here. Hit me with it. You can't buy this. The technology that underpins BEX is proven is the only credible large-scale way of generating such renewable power and delivering carbon removals. Here's the problem with this biofuel. It's imported from the U.S. in wood chips and pellets. Jeez. <laughs> you, I'm serious. The government is considering the, the request for bill payers to foot the cost of supporting its power plant beyond the subsidy scheme deadline of 2027. So it keep burning wood for power until the end of the decade. The only way this thing makes money is with tax subsidies. And, and it is not, I mean, you can't ship wood across the pond and expect the economics to actually be good for the environment or the pocketbook. I mean, just look at a fire that you build outside. Like, use your eyes. Of course there's more emissions from a fire. I mean, it's it, it's laughable that they actually thought this was a, a solution that would solve them. Oh, no, I, I don't get uh, burning wood for power is expensive risk that uh, UK inter independence is no place for a journey to net zero. This is net stupid. I, I can't believe that they're doing this. Sorry we need to that. make shirts that say net stupid. Politicians backing net zero, working hard to make gas prices much higher. Unbelievable, Michael. Net zero agenda is working to make gasoline prices much higher is basic arithmetic okay you can go to oklahoma state and they won't teach you how to add they expect you to add when you get there one mule plus two mule equals three mules <laughs> i'm serious biden administration that was funny biden That's administration supported the destruction of the fossil fuel they, they wanted to end fossil fuels day one they went ahead and they cut the the pipeline the keystone pipeline you go through some of this whole list of gas uh, gouging policies now remember you take a look at the other policies in here and that is they're coming from california they're trying to input California on the rest of the United States and all that is is net zero and this is not good well nothing like you see the EPA rolling out they say in this article the quote social cost of carbon that they want to put at a hundred and ninety dollars a ton which would be somewhat equivalent to about a dollar fifty addition per gallon of gas the social cost of carbon guess what as soon as they get control of social media and they can kill x they will go out and they will start finding you that if you put a mean tweet out <laughs> they're they're they'll be close to doing that they'll be close to doing that hey this is a great article i don't know who actually wrote this let me scroll down to the bottom here this is energy talking points oh this is out of uh, alex epstein this is we yeah. love alex epstein he lays out eight different gas gouging policies basically you've got Whole govern whole of government approach. Ugh, crazy. Ugh. You've also got Biden work to so number two is Biden has worked to increase gasoline prices by expanding anti-fossil fuel ESG divestment movement. The climate disclosure is number three. 
Yep. Climate disclosures. You got a moratorium on oil and gas leases for number four. Hiking the royalty length for new oil leases by over 50%. Okay. We'll push back a little bit. New Mexico had a low royalty rate that was not in line with federal leases in other states. So what they did was just right size it all. I, 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 I'm okay with that from the standpoint of that's not going to kill it's not killing production per se, but you know, we'll go there. Number six is critical though, restricting the leasing on nearly 50% yep. of the Alaskan petroleum reserve. Not number, great. FTC uh, number seven going after oil and gas mergers. I mean, we know that's true. All the stuff oh. they've done with Chevron, Exxon trying to leave Scott Sheffield off. Crazy. And then obviously number eight, canceling the Keystone XL pipeline, which yeah, you know unbelievable. Um, and of I course, think- now we gotta ship it. Oh, absolutely. And and now you see the Harris Walsh ticket is going to be even worse. So, all right. Well, don't you worry. Think- when Kamala Harris gets elected on day one, she's going to bring down inflation. Don't worry. When she gets elected, she'll bring down inflation. Not just, mind I- you that she's already been elected. Oh, yeah. She's now that talk she's to the been big man there. right now. She should wait till she gets elected to, to worry about it. I saw that. I saw her walk by and she made a comment and she says, I'm going to bring down grocery prices. I'm like, where have you been for the last four years? Can you just go talk to the big guy? <laughs> yeah, walk down the hall. Are you awake? Hello? Hey, let's go to the next story here, Michael. U.S. oil industry pumps record volumes with fewer workers. You and I have been talking about the efficiencies of scale for a long time, but efficiency and technology advancements in fracking services, as well as the ongoing consolidation in the industry, have been pushing employment numbers lower this year. Michael, what do you feel is the number one reason we've lost 29 or 2,962 jobs in May in oil field service, but yet we're still pumping out some big volume? Well, one, it's people are moving to, 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 you know, bigger pads, larger, you know, large, longer laterals. You know, you need the right. same amount of people to drill a four mile laterals. You do a two mile lateral, but instead of needing drilling two whales at the same time, you only drill one, you get the same amount of lateral length and let's not even talk about the amount of oil there's a little bit of degradation as you go up the you know you 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 increase mileage it's not a one for one ratio which it might be the difference is i think it comes back to what we always talk about when we talk about mergers it's the synergies and synergies this is what really hurts employment and this is specifically i think oil field service is seeing a lot of this because you know, rig count hasn't, you know, rig counts have been falling on the steady and that's always going to hurt right. uh, employment specifically on the service side. But I think what you're seeing and what this article points out is that the upstream sector, which is the operators themselves have been shedding jobs. And, you right. know, I, and I think a lot of people don't realize this because I think it's, you know, most of the people are, you know, it's early retirement. It's people who may have worked an extra five years who decide to get out of the industry now for a variety of reasons, because maybe they're getting right. pushed out. You know, they're being nicely told, hey, it would be nice if you retired. People getting, you know, whether it's, you know, layoffs happening in a merger and then then people deciding not to go back and, and get another and get a new job or, you know, the job market is 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 a little bit frothy right now when we talk about what's going on in the oil and gas. Yes, we've seen prices stabilize above 70, which has been great. But right. at the same time, we've seen production continue to rise. And, you know, you've kind of got that inverse relationship, which you think is which you think would be, you know, correlated together. But instead, we're seeing an inverse correlation. So wow. I think it's super interesting. I think a lot of companies have realized and especially as the shift from the shift from just produce oil to produce oil, but try to do it profitably. That's changed the narrative a little bit. And people and are expensive. Let's not let's be honest. Oh, people yeah. in the oil and gas industry are paid really well, as they should be. But. People who are the highest paid employees in any sector are the first ones generally to get laid off. Right. The EIA put out that the Don't get any U- ideas, Stu. You're you're paid a lot more than I am, dude, because you're worth a lot more. The EIA uh, expects crude oil production to average 12, 13.2 million barrels per day this year, up from an average of 12.9 million last year. In 2025, the U.S. crude oil production set to accelerate growth and hit an average of 13.7 million barrels per per day. Yeah, 
We all know the EIA is going to continue to revise up and up. They feel like it's better to to pitch for sanity purposes, pitch low number, and then revise upward based upon right. demand, which, you know, OPEC's probably the other way around. They're going to throw out a big demand number, probably revise downward. You're seeing the Permian take off. You're seeing a lot more degradation going on. It's, right. it's, it's, there's a lot going on. And then one thing I got to hand it to our great oil and gas oil field service, as well as oil field exploration folks, is we deliver the lowest emission oil and gas on the planet. We do it the best out of anybody. Well, so. I mean, what is this? You know, you know, the that the war in Ukraine, we're now bombing oil rigs. Yes, regard. Yes, I know it's a Russian oil rig. So not saying I'm in favor of Russia. But I mean, you're talking about the amount of emissions that are going to come out of that. Oh, that and no one's talking about it. It's oh yeah, we got Russia. It's like great. I'm all for getting Russia. Putin bad. I'm with you. Yeah. But, but now yeah. all of a sudden, but now we're gonna bomb oil rigs and no one's worried about the emissions going on from that. Yet we flare 10 MCF and everybody loses their mind. But let's let's pretend we're California and hypocrisy and import oil from Iraq. Like we said last week, you know, on the on the show, the we, we're the fourth largest Iraqian. I said Iran last week, but it's actually Iraq that we import oil for California. Is a that's hypocrisy. Let's go to the last story here before I get all worked up. Second LNG tanker seen docking at sanctioned Russian facility. Speaking of Russia, I call Putin on this one. Hey, you know, he's, hey, I'm sitting here looking at this and going, people were laughing at me when I was saying the dart fleet for me. LNG tankers are coming along. And they're, I'm like, dude, you ain't seen nothing yet. LNG dart fleet is alive and well, and it is growing. The number of new builds is a whole reason for this. They are making more LNG tankers than you can possibly shake a stick at. And so I found this one was pretty interesting. It was fired up. It's the Alessia Energy as part of the suspected dart fleet of LNG vessels. They, they even named it by the, how long it was. It's 290 meters or 950 feet long. That's pretty amazing. That's a fairly decent sized ship. Yeah, I mean, it. ironically, it's owned by an India-based company, so India could care less. They're doing what they think they need to do to supply themselves with low-cost energy. India, it's well, clear sanctions don't work. No, they are. They do not work as intended, as Irina Slav would say, but last week we ran an article on India has bought 1,000 more increase in their Russian oil purchases since the start of the Ukraine war. One thousand percent increase. You got to hand it to them. I'm all. Hey, I'm all for it. They got to take care of their people. They're got putting it. in. They got ten new coal mines going in. That's not plants. That's ten new mines, so they can quit buying coal from China. So anyway, Crazy. you got to love this mixed up energy world. Was you have it four years ago when you start in and started our podcast? Would you have believed that it would have gotten this crazy? Yeah, because I have to listen to you every day. I'm surprised <laughs> it's as calm as it is, actually. So, all right. Well, let's go ahead and jump over and cover what happened in the oil and gas and finance market, guys. But before we do that, let's go ahead and pay the bills. As always, thank you for checking out and visiting us at energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. All of the news and quote-unquote analysis that you've just heard is brought to you by that website. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Go ahead and check out the description below for all links to the articles that we cover, links to the timestamps. You can also check us out on Substack. And as always, we are partnering up with our friends over at the Crude Truth and Pecos Country operating the one and only Ray Trevino. If you've ever wanted to get involved with investing in oil and gas, you've ever wanted to call yourself an oil man, you ever wanted to roll the dice on some new drilling wells, we have a great, great opportunity for you. Go ahead and hit that link below. I think it's energynewsbeat.co backslash invest in oil, or just go ahead and check out the link below in the article. Buy yourself some working interest. Trust me, it's a great decision if you want to gamble all your money away in hopes that we hit a good one. Just kidding. But 
It's a great opportunity. It also has great tax deduction. Hit that description below if you're interested in learning more about that. We'll get you connected with everybody. Well, let's go ahead and jump over now into the overall markets. You know, we're talking half a percent. On the S&P 500, 53.44, NASDAQ was up about, a, again, a little over half a percentage point, sitting above 18,500. Two-year yields well a half a percentage point, but we did see 10-year yields shed about 1.2 percentage points. Dollar index fairly flat. Bitcoin dropped about 1.2 percentage points over the weekend as we record this Sunday afternoon on the 11th. Still sitting above 60,000, though. Crude oil on Friday up about a percentage point, 76.84, after barely squeaking above $77. Brent jumped above $80 and actually settled at 80.01. It was only about 0.2 percentage points. Natural gas up three quarters of a percentage point, two dollars and fourteen cents. It's you know, it was it was a frothy week, Stu. We were it was you know we were up, we were down, we were all over the place, everything in between. You know, on in terms of oil prices, though, we did see an overall kind of 3% week-over-week gain, mainly due to the fact of some more positive economic data that came out. A lot of what's going on is a little bit of, you know, we saw, you know, missiles flying from Iran. Syria came out and said they don't want to get, you know, stuff happened in Syria. NATO's doing some crazy stuff. So the geopolitical tension has ratcheted itself up a little bit, which will always come to put prices above. We also did hear Fed Chair Jerome Powell indicate that we were probably going to go ahead and lower rates come September. There was a trio of Fed policymakers that came out on Thursday and said that they were, quote, confident that inflation was cooling enough to cut rates. I'm not sure if I believe that, but that's what they're telling us. You know, we also saw a larger than expected fall in U.S. jobless claims, which people are saying, you know, help the recovery. But then again, if you listened to anybody, even this show on Monday, you thought the sky was falling because of this yen carry trade. So who knows what to believe, folks? The point is, don't believe anything. Nothing anyone says to you, you should believe. And especially if I say it, I'm telling you, because... It's all over the place. We also saw the number of Americans filing new applications for unemployment benefits fall, which is, hey, that's good. Quote, suggesting, according to Reuters, that fears in the labor market is that is unraveling were, quote, overblown and that the gradual softening in the labor market remains intact. I mean, again, do I believe any of this quote unquote analysis? I don't know. I think the markets are pretty frothy right now in terms of, you know, when you have this much volatility in the over, I mean, it's clear if you can have an eight, you know, what was it, a 6% drop on Monday because of some yen, because of what the Japanese Federal Reserve is, central bank is doing to their interest rates that causes the United States quote unquote flash crash. I mean, it's all rebounded, but it, 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 it to me, it underpins that the confidence that people claim they have in the markets isn't there or else people wouldn't panic sell. Now we can go back and talk about this, you know, this this yen carry trade. I'm tired of hearing about it. The point is, it's frothy out there, folks. We did see rig counts. We can go and throw this chart up. Rig counts were up two week over week, sitting at 588. Canada, we saw a drop of two rigs. Internationally, we saw a drop of 23 rigs. So United States bringing back them oil rigs, Stu. We got to love it. You know, this, going back to the story we talked about in terms of, you know, dropping employment in the oil and gas business, as rig counts rise, so will jobs. I mean, you're talking about we're still down 66 rigs from last year. I mean, that's, I mean, I've seen statistics out there that it's 100 people per rig is generally the type of you're talking there's at least you know six to ten thousand jobs just right there in rig counts let alone the support staff you need on the operator side let alone the economic impact down the chain that it brings because it's not just people that work on the rigs it's all these other people so it's uh it's a mess folks where's that hot shot when you need it yeah exactly (laughs) but you know markets do you know at least when prices open up here in a bit from an oil price standpoint you know, we, we look to be basically at $77 at the open, seventy six ninety eight. So, you know, as you listen to this Monday morning, things probably have rolled over, hopefully for the positive. Again, as the, as the and this is what I want to ask you, Sue, what's going on in the Middle East? Because that, in my opinion, is what's causing 
this, the topsy turvy in oil. No, the oil markets don't care about the yen carry trade. They don't really right. care about, they do care about supply and demand, but you know, we're seeing record oil production, but we're also seeing record demand. The volatility that we're seeing is what's going on in the Middle East. Walk us through what you're hearing. I'm hearing that Russia put out a notice, stay out of Israel airspace this next week in the next 10 days. That to me was the first rut row I've heard in a long time that kind of puckered me up a little bit. Iran was then threatening to that they have a rumor. Rumors are they may have five nuclear warheads. They were then going to say they were going to let one off in the desert and then come out and say that they are now a nuclear power. But I really firmly in my heart believe that they do not want to use those nukes yet. And I, if they do have them, I hope that they do not. But by Russia coming out and saying stay out of Israeli airspace, I can see why people are getting nervous. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't make me feel any better about what's, I mean, so so talk about what, what we expect to come up this week. I mean, do you expect we, to see things in the Middle East but, get spicier or oh, yes. more relaxed? Yeah. More, I think it's going to get spicier. The one that we're not talking about, and you haven't heard me talk about Russia, Ukraine war much at all. Ukraine went up and they went up into north, just east of the, oh, I have the article right here. And Russia in this section of Ukraine over by the Zud section is a section where they've actually gone into Russia and captured. The men are now all in circled around it. But what most people don't understand is that Ukraine has canceled their natural gas contracts to continue uh, carrying that Russian natural gas after 2024. Russia has decided that they are going to, Ukraine is not carrying 2024 gas from Russia past 2024. So 2025, they are no longer going to be doing it. That section in the Sudaz is got lots of pipelines that are interconnects right there right in that section but next to Russia in this area. So they're sitting on a bunch of natural gas pipelines that they're afraid that if they respond and blow those up, those are critical junction points for Russia. So it's pretty interesting. Nobody's really talking about how important that is. Yeah, I mean, you know, and then you got Lindsey Graham coming out this week saying, well, you know, Ukraine's sitting on 10 to $12 trillion of critical minerals. It's like, Oh, sweet. Thanks for saying the quiet part out loud. Thanks for saying the quiet part out loud, Lindsey Graham. He's going to have me enlist if it was up to him. He'd have me he'd, he'd have me storming the beaches in Sevastopol if it was he up is to a, him. He is truly a warmonger, and I wouldn't vote him out of office. No kidding. I am a non-war kind of guy. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. So, all right, guys. Well, with that lovely ending we'll let you get out of here you brought it up dude (laughs) all right guys well with that have a great week we appreciate you guys checking us out on the world's greatest podcast www.energynewsbeat.com for Stuart turley i'm michael tanner we'll see you tomorrow maybe